great. Thank you. We're going to, we are going to ask everyone to keep their videos off while we're presenting. Um, we are going to allow questions you can put at any time in the chat. And after each one of our guest speakers or presenters speak, we're going to allow um, about five minutes for questions. You can sign at that time. You can open your window and, and sign your questions if you'd like at that time. But again, we are going to limit. You can do chat at any time you would like during this um, uh, presentation. And again, we'll allow for five minutes of questions after each one of our presenters. So again, I thank you all for coming. This um, webinar is presented by the Commission on the Deaf and Hard of Hearing's Employment Committee. And we're trying to inspire people with great stories here tonight and help people uh, learn from each other. So, and at the very end, we're gonna open questions up to all our presenters. So anybody that has a question to any of the presenters or just have some dialogue about great experiences you had or advice you have for people. So um, I would like to, I, I'm the chair of the unemployment committee. Um, we have a few of our members that they want to just turn their um, cameras on real quick. We have Jan Luby, we have Paul, um, and I, and of course we have our executive director here, Ernest. So thank you. And Ernest, if you want to just give us a few um, words to everyone, introduce yourself. Sure. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Ernest Covington. I'm the executive director of the Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, and I'm really thrilled to see you all here tonight and see this our, this panel taking place, talking about uh, your journey and career development in the state of Rhode Island for the deaf and hard of hearing. Uh, any anecdotes that you have are worth sharing with the community for the deaf and hard of hearing, seeking jobs, and um, how would they would do that if they're disabled? How would they successfully uh, get a job and then keep retain the job in the long run? So thank you for the employment committee for holding this panel tonight. I hope that you all have a great experience and you learn some, you maybe ask a few questions. This is being recorded so you can refer this to other people. So if you know other people throughout the community who might benefit from this webinar, or would like some tips and how to gain employment or retain employment, uh, I would love for you to share this with the community. So we welcome you and we thank you for attending tonight on the behalf of the Rhode Island Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. And we have one more person, if you could turn on your camera real quick, Amy, she's also a new committee member. She's there. Thank you, Amy, for coming too. And we'll have other parts, other members of our committee. I'm Amy Hogue, and I'm a new committee member for Employment Committee. And today I'm basically learning and observing how the committee functions and just want to support and help out for people in their employment. I, um, those who'd like to gain more hours, who would like to work, who are part-time, who would like to go to full-time, trying to encourage uh, career development and growth. So thank you. Thank you, Amy. And I just wanna remind anybody that needs captioning, if you go into the more and click on subtitles, you can have captioning um, during this presentation. And I'd like to welcome our first panelist, April. If you could just start by introducing yourself, your profession, and some of your work history and any other information you want to share with us. So hello everyone and thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. I am currently a behavior health clinician at Perspective Cooperation. I like to say I'm a late deaf in person. I started losing my hearing later on. So prior to that, I was able to apply for regular jobs and my major have always been psychology. So with my psychology major, I always had group home jobs, group home positions, site supervisor position, manager positions, and I worked in group homes for several years because I knew I wanted to continue my psychological profession. Later on, I started losing my hearing, and I was always told that I would eventually lose my hearing because my dad is hard of hearing, 
and his full family is out of Haran, but they never took the initiation to learn sign language. So that's exactly what I wanted to do. And I could not figure out how to learn sign language. So I actually struggled with the fact that I had a hearing loss because I didn't know how to locate the resources. So I continued working and I thought hearing aids would help me. So I didn't learn sign language till later on. So doing the psychological work at uh, group homes and then eventually I went to Mass Bay College. And when I went to Mass Bay College in Wellesley, Massachusetts, I was still losing my hearing. And, but I was not doing sign language and I graduated from there. And then that's when my hair and started becoming really bad. And I was trying to figure out what to do. And I met with a vocational rehabilitationist and she was deaf. And she encouraged me to go to Gallaudet University. So when I went to Gallaudet University as an undergrad, that's when I started learning everything about deaf culture. And that's when I learned ASL. And it was really hard for me being an older person trying to blend in, but it was really beautiful. Gallaudet is a beautiful place and it's the best place you can go to to learn sign language and learn about that culture. And so after I graduated, I ended up with a job at CSSD, Community Support Services. And I was focused on medication for deaf and hard of hearing seniors and um, IDD adults with PLUS diagnosis, and that was really a tough job. And then I also had a position with Maryland School for the Deaf in Frederick, Maryland. And I was there for several years. And while I was there, I learned sign language and I was doing residential counseling there. And then after that, I moved to Baltimore and I started working at Maryland School for the Deaf in Columbia, Maryland. And then after that, I have my daughter. So I moved here to Rhode Island. And then I got accepted to grad school. So I moved back to Washington, DC and went to grad school. And after I graduated from grad school, I wanted to come back to Rhode Island because my family is here. And when I moved back here, I started working at, well, I was, I, I was rewarded with an internship at Rhode Island School for the Deaf first. And then I started working there as a behavior specialist. And that was a part-time position. So I wanted full-time. So then after that, I ended up working at Deaf Inc. as an assistant director. And then I realized I was not focused on the psychological work the social work and what I went to school for. And I said, oh, I'm in the wrong position. I need to do something different. I need to focus on what I went to college for. So that is when I got a job from, I think it's Family Service Foundation, Family Service Foundation in Rhode Island. I was doing trauma work. So when I was doing that trauma work with young adults, it was all hearing individuals. And I was the only hard of hearing person there. And I felt really alone. And I was constantly explaining the fact that I was hard of hearing. I couldn't hear everything. I was missing out on information, but I really did have good relationships with the families and the clients and the workers. But I just didn't feel comfortable in the environment being the only hard of hearing person. So that's when I realized perspective was looking for a behavior health clinician focusing on deaf and hard of hearing individuals. And I applied and got the job. So that's what I'm doing now. So, so I have the questions here. So the challenges were for me, being a late deaf person, I always wish that I was either born deaf. I, I, I always say that, oh, if I was born deaf, I can sign better, I can communicate it better. And I just wanted to be deaf so bad because you know deaf culture is, is amazing. And I just had to accept myself. I had to accept the fact that I'm hard of hearing and how I navigate for services and how I navigate for what I need is different. So sometimes I can't sign it and sometimes I can't say it. So I have to explain that. I, I am 
the boss of my own self. So I had to learn mm -hmm. to advocate for myself and you as an individual and myself as an individual, we are the best advocators for ourselves. So that's something I had to learn. And I had to learn how to speak up. I had to learn how to take things, not to take things personal because people are not always aware of what you need. And when you're quiet or when you're shy or afraid to say it, just remember people cannot read your mind and it's okay to speak up. So the challenges for me were, you know, I, I always struggled with speaking up with what I need because I, I don't know a lot of hard of hearing people. I think I know more deaf people than hard of hearing people. And I sometimes wonder, you know, if we can have more resources for hard of hearing, you know, cause I, I don't locate a lot of hard of hearing people like me and I don't meet them and it's hard to come by. So you want me, you have any questions for me? Am I in well, the right track? Well, you know, it's what you just mentioned about the hard of hearing world and it's, and, and what you've mentioned, and I've been in my position for about 15 years and I've noticed how wonderful the deaf community is together because they can have socialization and it's not a struggle. And then you have the hard of hearing people that are surrounded with hearing people that don't understand that if you don't face them, um, if you're not like, you know, you're not being rude, you just didn't hear them. Have you encountered a lot of that, that people are thinking you're rude uh, because you hadn't answered their question or, or has that, has it been stigma with that? Um, have you faced that in your work environment? So I, in the past, I faced that in my work environment when I worked in environments that were not deaf friendly and did not have deaf and how to hear resources. And it's not their fault. It's, it's a lack of an awareness because they were not aware and they were not trained. And I think a lot of those jobs need professional training and they need to understand how to provide resources that we need, you know, interpretation, heart, and how to communicate with a person. But as of now, I work at Perspectives Cooperation and we have a deaf and hard of hearing program. So no, I don't experience that right now, but sometimes it's totally opposite. Like I'll use my voice and they'll say, oh, are you hearing? No, no, I'm not hearing. <laughs> you know, I experienced that, so it's totally opposite. But uh, perspective is a great place to work. And have you um, been able to educate other people in the workforces where they weren't as aware of deaf culture and hard of hearing people? Was there anything that you felt that you you was there a way that you could approach it that you needed accommodations and things like that? And um, how did that go when you approached that those conversations with your employer? Oh, you're talking about my previous jobs, right? Previous job, yep. So they they were not a lot of the workplaces were not receptive to it. They they were not willing to provide interpretation, and I think it had a lot to do with they just didn't get it. They they thought, oh, if you can talk, then you can hear, and they it was stereotyping, and it made me really upset. And it was it was a very uncomfortable conversation. So if a person has a need you need to approach that situation or that their needs. You, you should not question it or you should not assume for the person because you never know what the person is going through. So yes, I went through that a lot. And instead of me constantly asking for support and asking for help, I would probably eventually just quit and give up and say, hey, I'm gonna go somewhere else, you know, somewhere where I'm appreciated and somewhere where they would understand deaf and hard of hearing culture. That's how I approached that situation back then because, you know, I was really, struggling and it was very stressful and I, and I hope like by being bringing more awareness and more resources to employers that's going to be one of our next um, uh, goals is to try to educate more employers on all the wonderful ways of communication and things like that in the future so again I know that exists I'm happy you're in perspective it sounds like you're really happy there um, does anybody have any questions for April? You can um, put it in chat if you have a question um, or you can open up your window and you can sign a question if you have it. Um, Dee. I have a question. I have a strong relationship with April and in terms of access and um, hearing, right? And talking, assuming that you can hear. It's like I talk and then they assume I can hear because of that. So, you know, I either prefer to speak or talk. I have to pick one language or the other. 
And for me, I can kind of go back and forth, but other people might not be able to. So speaking, sometimes people just assume that you can do both hear and talk. So go ahead, April. I, um, I, I, I experienced the same thing, like being hard of hearing sometimes. I don't know what I want to do when it comes to communication. <laughs> sometimes it's like, oh, I'll sign it. I'm oh, no, no, I'll just say it. And I think it's, it's just something we hard of hearing people go through. And we just don't know. It just takes us time to process information. It takes us time to relay the information. And it takes us time to explain the information. So yes, it's, it's OK. I just let people know. Just identify what you need and tell them because you're the only person that can tell them just like I am too. You, you are the boss of yourself. And I would have people um, ask, ask me, oh, where can you take sign language classes? Because they were losing, the, they were late in death. So they um, were like, oh, I'm going to take sign language class. I go, does anybody you know know sign language? And they're like, no. I go, well, then you have to you have to bring your community. And that's another thing for the hard of hearing people. If you're not around other deaf individuals or people that sign, it does you no good to sign if you're not around other individuals. April? So when I uh, first went to Gallaudet University, I didn't know any signs at all. And so when I got there, I was, they there they call it a deaf culture shock. That's what they call it. And I was just like, what is that? What does that mean? And they say when it's the first time you see that culture. So when I went to the campus, everyone was signing. It was so quiet. And I was just like, oh, wow, what's going on? Is something wrong? But then I said, I need to sign up for sign language classes. And they said, no, you don't. You're already losing your hair and throw yourself in the fire and learn. And that's exactly yeah. what I did. They did not let me sign up for classes. And I just picked it up on my own with everybody else I was with. And I didn't have a choice. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, April. And we'll bring you back at the end of the, um, at the presentation. Thank you again, April. You're welcome. Um, Alex, can we have you go next? You wanna just introduce yourself and just give us some background? There we are. All right, here I am. The videotape of the interpreter wasn't uh, visible to me. And now that I saw it, I was like, oh, she's calling me. <laughs> so great, here I am. Yes, I'm Alex Balsley. And I'm very grateful to be on the panel with all of the other participants. That's great to hear April's story and her work experience, just so fascinating, it's fabulous. So I really appreciate the opportunity to experience, to share my experience with all of you. I was brought, brought up in Western Mass. I went to the Clark School for the Deaf. I was born deaf and I, I had a full hearing loss. So the Clark School, they taught you oral there. For people who are not familiar with that school, it's not a sign language school, it's spoken and I had a deaf family. So of course I communicated with my deaf family, but I was taught orally in school. After Clark, I left when I was 10 and I went to a mainstream program. I was the only deaf person at my town, the school system. Well, my brother joined later. Um, he came in for two years, he's older. And then one point we were the only two in the class, but I mean, in the school. Then I went to Northeastern University in Boston and I majored in environmental engineering and I was there for five years and they had support services, ASL interpreters in my class there at NU. And during that time at Northeastern, if you're not familiar with Northeastern, they have a co-op program, which means that you go to classes, you're in there for five years, but there are three six month periods where you're actually getting work experience, you're getting a co-op, it kind of basically helps you have hands-on experience. I mean, I was doing civil and environmental engineering and it gives you an opportunity to actually work with civil engineering firms and pick up, um, I mean, training on the job basically to see what, you know, what it would look like and whether you had the, uh, aptitude for it. So I did have these three different companies that I worked with over those five years in those three co-op periods. That was a fascinating experience. And I can talk about that more too at this time. And after Northeastern, 
I took a year off because studying engineering can be a little stressful. And I worked in a summer camp in Colorado, a, com a camp for the deaf. And that was a fantastic experience. After that, I started working and uh, looking for work. I was like adulting, as they say. And I went to Washington, DC. I was looking at a, for a job fair for people with disabilities. And some of you may be familiar with it. My goal was to be able to work for the EPA. And I know that they have, it's a good agency. And I, I knew it would be um, good with my field, with especially water treatment. That's something I really care about. The EPA is a good fit for that for environmental engineers. And you know how the job fairs are. You meet with people and they give you, you give their resume and they ask some questions and ask about your background and your experience and why are you interested in that work. So you have a brief conversation with different people in an, each of the organizations. And as I was going out, I noticed there was the Coast Guard booth. And I had one resume left, so I was walking out of the fair. And for some reason, the Coast Guard, I, I had not thought about them needing environmental engineers, but I was like, I have the resume, I'll just give it to them, I'll speak to them. And they were like, yes, we have a lot of environmental engineering work in the Coast Guard. So they asked where I lived and I said, well, I'm in Massachusetts, New England area. And they said, we actually have research and development center in Connecticut, in New London, Connecticut. And that was 11 years ago. I'm still working there. <laughs> so that is my job experience so far. During the time when I was working for the Coast Guard, I went to a graduate program at WPI and I got a master's degree in environmental engineering. Let's see, what else? Oh, the other question you had asked about challenges on the paper that you gave us. So in general, I was thinking that the perception can become reality for a lot of people. So when you go into a job interview, and it's funny because for me, as I said, I did those co-op jobs. So I was experienced with interviews and working and I thought maybe there'd be an interpreter but if I, there was an interpreter, it might hurt my chances of getting the job. I don't want the people to think I'm dependent on an interpreter and look at me as somebody who's dependent. You know, oh God, we're going to have to provide all these extra needs and we're going to have to have all these services for you. So I would go into job interviews without interpreters. And I was able to do it. I can use hearing aids. I feel comfortable speaking with people, especially on a one to one. And over time, I have actually changed personally now. My communication preference is sign language, but in the back, the past and back then, I thought the best way to actually sell myself was to demonstrate that I could be independent on the job. And even though I would get these jobs in each of these places, I realized that I wasn't being true to myself and that sign language, well, my thought process, I think, was incorrect because I assumed that they would think that they would look at me as using sign language and using an interpreter that would make me a burden to the company. And that, that thing, there is a reasonable accommodation under the ADA and that exists. And you have to advocate for that. You have to advocate for yourself. So you need these things, you, you know, sometimes it's not easy to negotiate those things, but, you know, some of the people I worked with, some of them are very flexible, very understanding. They know that you have these needs. They're willing to work with you to resolve them and other people are not. And those people are like that. But I think that you need to be able to say, there's a lot of ignorance out there on their part. And we, as people who have you know, deaf and hard of hearing background, we have to make them aware of what they can do to change their perception because it's not necessarily reality. That if they learn more about what we can do in each situation, those specific situations, the reasonable accommodation for another situation might be totally, you know, doable for them. So 
I, I, I think that was a challenge as far as me and job interviews. The, to this day, I still, I do job interviews. I'm happy where I work right now, but I always think it's good to brush up my skills and go out looking just to see what people are looking for. It's good to understand the field, what opportunities are around me. You know, even though I'm in this little Coast Guard bubble, I don't want to only know about that. So I want to familiarize myself with other things out there. And the other thing you had talked about in the notes was triumphs or successes. And I think it's very valuable to go through a job interview, whether you're deaf or hearing, to come in and be prepared with your, prepare for the position that you're interviewing for and be prepared with the interpreter that you go to the interview with. Because sometimes the interpreter, they're the very important part of, uh, you know, they, they if they know what you're gonna be signing and they know the technical terminology you're gonna be using, for me, environmental engineering, there's a lot of technical terms. And I do need to take the time to practice with that interpreter. And it's easier if you're familiar with the interpreter prior, but even if you go in with somebody who you don't know, take the time to prepare beforehand because the job interview that that interpreter is going to work in, you want to be on the same page with them. You don't want to have gaps in the communication, especially during the interview process. So I have found I get well prepared for an interview, both for the job end of things and on the interpreter end of things. That's how I function. Alex, do you think you changed people's perspectives when you came in so prepared to for an interview that that they might not have thought of hiring you, but then when they saw how confident you were, that that might have changed their perspective? I would like to think so. Um, I, I mean, I've worked now at the Coast Guard for 11 years. So some of the people who were in the original interview with me and it's all, I have a funny story about the Coast Guard interview. At the time, I was still in the mindset of not needing an interpreter. And I showed up at the interview alone. And there were 11 people on a long table on every side of me, right? And it was like the worst situation for somebody to think, you know, that's when I started to realize it would have been best if I had had an interpreter. But I thought to myself, don't ever come in to a job <laughs> interview without an interpreter. But that interview, actually, I was very lucky because there was a person who was the head interviewer at the, and they, they were easy for me to lip read. I could understand them. But then the rest of the people, there was one person who was way off in the corner and they introduced themselves and the sun was behind them. The window was coming in, uh, the light, and it shadowed their face. It silhouetted them. And I couldn't see that person's mouth at all. And I felt like the interview went like everybody introduced themselves. And I was able to catch most of it, except for that one person in the corner. <laughs> and then, it, you know, after they in inter introduced themselves, it went around the group. And I explained my job experience and all of this. And then the last question came from that person and I needed to answer. And, you know, they, they each of them had a question to give and it gets up to this person in the corner. And they said, I have no more questions. I was like, oh my gosh. And it went to the next person. I was lucky, but it definitely made me realize it's the importance of coming prepared and preparing with the interpreter to, to you know, it's a reasonable accommodation. It's something you need for your own success. And also the people that I interviewed with at that time, I felt like at the very, very beginning when I started working with some of them, there was a little awkwardness. They didn't know how to speak with deaf people. They didn't know how to, you know, speak to me through an interpreter. But 11 years later, I get along with most of them. They know who I am. They know my capabilities. They know my skill set. They know what I'm able to do. And Personally, I feel like I'm an easy person to work with. I do try to be very friendly with people. I try to be, I want to make them feel at ease. I don't want them to be uncomfortable because I'm deaf. You know, if they can't understand me, I tell them that's fine. You know, you don't have to understand me the first time we can work together on that. 
I didn't make it less awkward for me. And of course, there are some people who are just like get right in there right away and easy for them. And then there's other people, it's individual differences. So yeah. Well, thank you, Alex. Did anybody have uh, any questions in chat or if they want to open up their window and, and uh, sign a question to Alex? Anybody have any questions? Okay, you see, look how thorough, Alex. So, and again, we're going to bring Alex back at the end of our, our panel and, and we'll ask some more questions. So thank you, Alex. Amanda, can you be our next panelist? Hello. Are we set? We're good? Hi, hi Heather. Hi Amanda. <laughs> I'm Amanda. So I grew up in Massachusetts and I uh, went to the learning center and I transferred to uh, mainstream. So I had both experiences of deaf and mainstream being at the learning center and then going to a uh, mainstream setting. I went to RIT and I majored in communication. And I worked in retail for a little bit and I realized, you know, I really got it. I want to go back to school. So I went to UMass and that's in Western Massachusetts. I got my master's in, uh, in, in labor studies. Just uh, basic work rights and the like. So I spent two years there. And then I went to work at an organization called Mass Aflico. <laughs> it's AFL-CIO. It's so that's the at the national level. That's at the national level, but but I was working at the state level. So I spent two years there. And I was the only deaf person there. Then I went to law school here in Rhode Island. And I went there for three years. And then I worked for a law firm for two and a half years. And for the past five years, I've been at Convo. It's a VRS provider. It's a deaf owned company. So my first, that was actually my first deaf workspace. So I'd say over the course of 15, maybe 20 years of employment experience, this is my first deaf employment experience in terms of environment. And so it was a little bit different, but it's my career journey. A big challenge for me in looking for work, job search, it was a big change. So in the early 2000s, the challenges back then were very different than the challenges that we have now. In the beginning, I was very concerned about how am I gonna communicate? How am I gonna contact them via phone? It was a stressful situation. And now we have VRS. So we're able to use the phone, the video phone. It's a different experience. We have text. Email technology is a different world. And I, didn't, I, mean, I don't say that's easy by any means, but the challenges are different than they were back then. The solutions that we bring and the resources that we have are different. So in terms of technology, it's kind of brought some relief to our community. What else? Other challenges in terms of job search? Oh. How, um, before you were, now you are currently in a deaf um, workplace or employer, how does that differ from when you were not? Is it a lot more comfortable for you or um, did you find not, you found you adjusting to the mixed environment, not an issue? How, how, how did, the, how are those different environments for you? The experience is very different. Yes. 
at a deaf workplace, our language is ASL in terms of in a, in a space that's not deaf, deaf, that means that you'd have to talk. So you need that accommodation to be made. We need to bring interpreters and we have a full staff interpreting team there. So if I wanted to meet with the FCC, I could easily just pull in my resources. I have interpreters at my fingertips. I don't have to think about and strategize about how I'm gonna have to contact HR and how am I gonna ask for this? What paperwork do I have to fill out? And you know, we have this on staff, it's convenient for me. But that taught me something similar to what Alex was speaking of. At the hearing workplace, I can ask for interpreters. I can ask for accommodations. I could have said, yeah, I need an interpreter, but I tried to kind of keep the peace. You know, I didn't want to uh, make attention for myself or call, you know, slow things down. I, I just wanted to kind of get along with it, you know, so I didn't ask for it. The only thing I did ask for was the VRS accommodation, so video phones. And honestly, that took me two years and it never got approved. I fought and I fought and I fought, never got anywhere. But now looking back, now that I see what my experience is with full access, I would have spoken up more. I would have stood by what my needs more. I would have made some noise, if you will. I can see that I perform better. I perform fine in both environments. It's just, I'm more confident. I can focus on the content of my work, not trying to focus on the contents of people's language. It's a lot of energy wasted in terms of lip reading. And I can speak, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's still energy and it's the wrong space. It's more thoughts about, you know, my mission. Why am I in this meeting? What are my goals? And interpreting and all that, I just, with the interpreter there, I can just focus on the goals with my accommodations being met. That's, I can focus on my job. And now if I go to a hearing workplace someday, don't worry if anybody's here, if anybody can see me here, my boss, I'm not going anywhere. I'm just saying if, if I decide to go into a hearing environment, I will speak up. I will advocate for myself. And, you know, I will say to them, I need an interpreter and this is my accommodation. This is how I'm accommodated and I trust that that's what I need. And once they see that and the interaction that we have, I'm sure that from there on out, they would oblige. Did, did anyone ever give you any issues with getting an interpreter or it's just how you internally felt about it? Well, I'll explain two different work, work places and my experiences there. The first one was really cool. You know, they were accommodating. That's the AFC IO one. Now understand it's a work right center. So that's what their focus, that's what their mission is. <laughs> so obviously they're gonna go ahead and accommodate me and not give me a problem about it. But I did approach it with the mentality of, and making me feel like, you know, they knew what to do. They didn't have to go research and look for the resources that I needed. I brought that. I gave them the phone numbers to contact. I worked everything out. I kind of coordinated things and they were, they were fine with it. They thought it was cool. And it didn't, wasn't a burden for them. And they didn't feel like it was a financial burden either. The second place of employment, ironically, was a big company has plenty of money, plenty of boots on the ground, right? And I'm sure that they could afford it, but they were the ones that had a delayed response to me that they, they never said no. They were just, yeah, oh, we're still looking into it. Uh, we're still on it. It's on the lawyer's desk and it was empty promises. So I ended up writing a memo and explaining and advocating for my own rights and you know, show that there have been court decisions that say, you know, this mandates an interpreter and still 
you know, they never got back to me. Well, I'm glad you're employed now where you feel like you're empowered and that would, that will, you'll take that into your future. So I think that's wonderful that now that you have all the accommodations you need, you wouldn't go back the other way. Um, does anybody have any questions for Amanda? Um, feel free to turn on your um, camera. Feel free to sign or put something in chat. Amy. Hi. Hi, Amanda, I have a question for you. What's your job at Convo specifically? What's your title there? What do you do? I'm a CLO for Convo, but my journey in Convo, in Convo has kind of shifted. So I started in PACE only, compliance only. And that means that I was focused on FCC regulations, making sure that we were in compliance. Then I expanded my role and I started covering um, regulations, business regulations, business contracts. That was an interpreter era. Uh, business contracts I started dealing with. Um, that was a part, big part of my job. And then internationally, I was coordinating opportunities between lawyers that we work with, various partners that we work with, so oversee all of their work. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions for Amanda? Um, one last question, Amanda. Do you have any advice on um, people looking um, for interviewing and getting a job? What, how do you feel like you became that, the, you put yourself at the top of the list? What, what things did you do to prepare for your interview that might be helpful? Anticipating the type of questions that may be asked and preparing to answer those questions. Be aware of the job that you're applying for and does that suit what you've been doing and how are you going to transition from your current role to a new role because some people you have to convince them what have you been doing and how what you've been doing will apply to this role that you're applying for thank you amanda um, next, we have James Litback, our next panelist. Hi, James. Hello, everyone. Okay. Um, is my microphone on okay? Because I've been good. having some You're issues. Good. Okay. If I go too quickly, um, please wave your hand so I can slow down. Um, sometimes I tend to talk very quickly and then all of a sudden I'll notice that the interpreter's hands are smoking and I'm getting dirty looks. <laughs> and I don't want that to happen. <laughs> um, I, when we started, I took a quick look at the participant list and I'm seeing some names there of people that were on my journey to employment 30, 35 years ago. So there's some people in this audience that know the story already. <laughs> okay. You know who you are. <laughs> okay. Um, currently, I am the manager for Rhode Island Relay. And what that basically means is I do all of the outreach in Rhode Island and I educate people, both relay users and businesses, um, what Rhode Island, um, what Rhode Island Relay is. When COVID wasn't happening, I would go to all of those like senior fairs and you would see me at a table and I would be handing out information. 
hopefully pretty soon I'll be doing that again. How did I get to where I am? Well, like I mentioned, it, it was a journey 30 years or more in the making. Uh, I noticed some similarities in my employment history with April's, our first speaker. Uh, so some of this you may have already heard of. Okay. How far back should I go? All right, I, um, I graduated um, from, I'll go back a little bit further. I decided I wanted to go to a local college. So even though I had been accepted into Gallaudet University, I decided that I would go to Rhode Island College. And at that time I went into Rhode Island College with the goal of becoming an English teacher for the deaf. And my major was secondary education. And an interesting thing happened while I was in college. The classes that were related to my major, I would not enjoy in, I would not get in good grades, but the classes related to social work, psychology, sociology, all things I was taking as elective, I was very interested in and I was getting good grades. So that made me switch my major to psychology. And it was around that time that I started working as a job coach. I also started working in group homes and I was getting a lot of experience in that. Uh, let me just jump ahead a little bit. After I graduated from Rhode Island College, I started, um, I interviewed and got a job at Perry Independent Living Center as an independent living counselor. And I, I was there for 19 years. Unfortunately, that agency had to close. So I was left looking for another job. I worked at the Ocean State Center for Independent Living. And then a position opened up for a supervising position at the Trudeau Center. And I interviewed for it and I did get that position. And I was there for about three and a half to four years before I'm in my current position. Okay. Um, there's a lot of little stuff that I left out because we only have 10 minutes, but that's the basic summary. Um, I'm going to go back to my college years. Some of this, I learned some stuff at college that was very important for me later on when I started interviewing for jobs. Rhode Island College was awesome about getting sign language interpreters for me. So there was never an issue with that. The issue I ran into was that there were more than a few professors of the class that just simply did not want to have an interpreter in their, in their classroom sitting near them. They knew that they couldn't say, you know, not in my classroom but they would make requests like, oh, could you guys sit in the back corner? Or could you sit to the side? And personally, that, that did not work for me because, you know, I'm paying money. The Office of Rehab Services is paying money. I wanna see both the professor like getting paid by all of this and the interpreter. So like right now, a lot of us are watching the interpreter and me. You want to be able to see both. So I learned how to what I like to refer to as um, firm, but not aggressive advocating. Sometimes I would try to butter up the professor a little bit. You know, just to make them understand, I would say, Oh, I understand that you're concerned that the interpreter will be a distraction and the class will stare at you 
instead of, uh, I mean, still it's the interpreter instead of you. But I can assure you that it's not an issue. And I want to be able to be able to see the what content the interpreter is interpreting, meaning like I want to be able to see what the professor's facial expressions are. And that usually works. Like when you're not, when you don't start with you let me use the interpreter and let me sit where I want, everybody gets defensive. And the thing that I learned from that was that it's okay to ask for an accommodation. And later on, um, depending on which job I was applying for, I would sometimes ask for a sign language interpreter. I would also sometimes ask for more information about the, how is the interview going to be conducted? Because in some situations, um, I'm comfortable, me personally, I'm comfortable with just one-on-one -on -one if a quiet room can be provided. Okay. And, I, and I've known you, James, for a very long time now. And I can say one of you've been in our ATEL committee meetings for, for I don't even know how many years, but you were always, especially when new people come, you always do things with a smile, like one at a time, but you're always like a smile and you always say a joke, but you always correct everyone. And, and I, I really do value how you approach it. You don't make people feel bad, but you do also don't let them get away with it. So mm -hmm. I think how, how you approach things in life, and it, just from my perspective of, of working with you, is just having a smile on your face and, and reminding people that aren't used to working with the deaf and hard of hearing that you do need to speak one at a time. You, you do need to face you. You really, that, that and I know you always say, it's important what you're saying. And I really want to know what you're saying. Please face me when you talk because I don't want to miss out. So mm -hmm. I really think your, your approach in life makes you very welcoming in, in the community, so. Mm -hmm. Yes, I find that also that approach, like using the example that you just gave, um, I find that it makes people realize that, you know, I'm not asking for special consideration. I'm just asking to be able to participate. Uh, like, for example, like different committees or, you know, people might ask me to join that thing, but what's the point of me being on it if, I'm not able to participate. Um, so another thing I wanted to mention, um, I want to talk about a, an, an interview I went to that ended up being a disaster for me, because I think it could be a good learning thing for all of us here. And a couple of presenters have already mentioned this, that it's a good idea to know what to expect going into the interview. Uh, I mentioned that I have worked at Perry for about 19, 19 years. That was my full-time job. Most people that know me know that I like to keep myself very, very busy. So I often have a lot of contracting and part-time work going on. And there was a, an agency that I was interested in working for, and it was going to be a group home type of job. And I thought I had gotten all the information about the interview, but clearly I didn't. Because for that interview, I mistakenly made the personal decision that I'll be fine just one-on-one. -on -one. No interpreter, no FM equipment. All I asked for was a quiet room. They accommodated the quiet room, but there was a the vital piece of information that was missing was that they were going to be interviewing 15 candidates at the same time. Oh, wow. So we were all at a long conference table. Finding out three minutes before the interview begins makes I'm in this position of like, well, I can't 
advocate for something that I never requested. And it's too late to make that request. So I really messed up. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for James if you want to put it in chat or open up your window to ask him? Okay. Right. Thank you, James. We'll see you at the end. <laughs> okay, I'll be back. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to the interpreters and the captioner. Mm -hmm. Claudia. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, it's been really interesting listening to everyone that's gone before me. Um, I am an educator. Um, I received my Bachelor's of Arts in Elementary Education and Psychology from Rhode Island College. And later, I went back to get my degree, uh, master's degree for a reading specialist. Um, that being said, I work for the Providence Public Schools um, as a fourth grade teacher. I've been there for almost 25 years. Um, during that time, I did go to look for another job at one point and was able to take a job in Lincoln um, Public School Department and a fifth grade position. Um, and during my work, my career also, I've also worked for Rhode Island Tutorial and Educational Services as a tutor. Um, working with um, children through high school, from elementary all the way through high school with reading, writing, uh, math, um, study skills, and executive functioning skills, um, as well as SATs and college essay preparation. I did that for about five years and during my, my career. Um, enjoyed it immensely. Um, just my full-time job took on more responsibilities, so I had to um, relinquish the part-time job. Um, for me, I've had struggles. Um, I have latent hearing loss due to Meniere's um, syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, I started with Meniere's uh, basically in 1997 um, after a severe flu and not knowing that it might have been in my, my history, it exacerbated an issue that was underlying. Um, through the years, I've been slowly losing hearing. Um, thank God I don't have a lot of vertigo issues uh, here and there. But the problem is having um, slow hearing loss, I've encountered with my boss, a few of my bosses, um, they don't understand why I can hear it sometimes and other times I can't hear. Um, honestly, it's taken... See, it's 2021. I started probably back in 2010, um, trying to really add, talk talk about. I think I started coming out more. I was afraid to come out and say that I was hard of hearing. I had a friend that was a special ed teacher. She noticed I was having trouble hearing conversations in the teacher's room. She's the one who spoke to me and said, "I think you're having problems. You're not hearing everything. You're not responding to things in the in the proper way." Um, so she was a really good support for me and I kept it in my, I was really uh, secluded with my, my small group of people. I didn't want to tell anybody. They helped me through meetings. Um, as my hearing loss progressed, um, I would get in trouble sometimes with the administration because I would lean over and whisper to find out if I heard what I heard or to write something down to someone. And again, it, it has to do with personalities. Um, this particular person I think is very sensitive, thinking that it might be criticism. Um, and I had to explain that it wasn't criticism. And ironically, as the years have gone on, um, there have been other people that have been coming out saying that they're having, they have hearing losses and now they're getting hearing aids. And so I think she's starting to understand and accept things a little more. Um, but it's been difficult because it's hard to advocate when one, you're first coming into hearing loss, you're not sure of yourself and in, you're in between the deaf and the hearing world. Um, you don't know how much you're supposed to put yourself out there. How much should you tell people? I'm at the point now where I'm finally, I don't mind. I don't care. I tell people, um, I do the best I can. I think a lot of the problem was in that time is I was hiding who I was. 
I was adapting so well that my bosses or certain colleagues didn't understand that I was just adapting and not um, faking it. Mm -hmm. um, so it got to a point where uh, because of the Menier's disease, um, I was working in a dismissal uh, after school duty room and it was a gym and the acoustics were so loud and I had 400 children in there. And for me, I have tinnitus and the minis would exacerbate. It was a prime setting to exacerbation. I tried to get myself into another um, position where I could do outside duty. And um, so I was trying to advocate for myself and like some of the other um, speakers have said, it wasn't to ask for special favors, but just asking for an alternative that would be an accommodation. Um, so my struggle has been with actually teaching others about my condition and what it means. My struggle has also been, you know, learning how to communicate um, in the environment, um, what to ask for, what, what would be okay. So it took me until about 2012, I started the process of advocating for myself. Um, I had uh, one of a set of twins, the other colleague had the other twin who was deaf. And we were using an amplification system for the student in the classroom. And that's when it dawned on me that this could be helpful for me. Okay. And I started the process of asking for an amplification system. And the pushback was immense. Uh, I was told that I didn't need one. I was told that I had to go to several different doctors from the school department. I had my doctors, all my medical paperwork. I had all of my audiology exams. They saw them all. And I was kindly sent a letter saying, you have good health insurance. You can get hearing aids when I already had hearing aids. Right. Um, so it, it's been a struggle. It's been a struggle between, um, deciding to keep myself quiet and um, adapting and finally saying, no, I deserve to have certain things in place in order so I can be more successful and not exhausted from lip reading. And especially now in this current situation with the children wearing masks, it's become wow. difficult. Um, I'm pretty exhausted at the end of the day. Uh, but so through this whole process, um, I ended up buying my own amplification system. I got pushed back on that also. Um, I got a lot of comments like, who do you think you are? Why are you using an amplification wow. system? So um, I continued with it. I didn't give up and um, it worked better for my students as well. The interesting thing in the employment journey, when I went for a job in Lincoln, um, again, I didn't tell them up front. I didn't hide it, but I didn't say it right away. Um, I went to the interview. Everything went well. I was hired. We were walking through the building, and I forgot how the comments went. We talked about uh, amplification or something, and, and I said, well, I do have hearing aids. I just decided to put it out there because I already had a job, yeah. and I was <laughs> in a situation where – if things didn't work out, I still had the opportunity to go back to the job this one time. So I put it out there and the principal was like, oh, not a problem. We have amplification system throughout the whole building. Wow. And I was shocked. I was stunned. And I, you know, <laughs> I was just absolutely stunned. And he acted like this is not a problem at all. And wow. it was a different experience. Um, I was less exhausted. Um, it was unbelievable. So what ended up happening was there were some budgetary cuts and last one in is the first one to go. So I, I had to go back. So I went back to Providence, resumed my position. But after that experience, it built my confidence, um, made me realize that people are accepting. Uh, not everyone um, will be naysayers, so to speak. And um, so when I went back, I said, no, I'm going to, I'm going to continue with my amplification system. I'm going to use my microphones. The kids love their wireless. So they, yeah. it works well for the kids. It works well for me. Um, and of course I have times where if someone's mumbling, you can't amplify mumbling. It just doesn't work. 
so so far it's 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 worked. I'm still struggling with times when I can't hear the kids, especially with masks. I've had to ask them to write things down. Um, I have high frequency loss, so I have trouble with certain consonants and things like that. Uh, so that's my struggle right now with the kids. Things are getting better with my administrators because now they're they're realizing, I guess, as I've lost more hearing and they've noticed it, they realize, oh, this is really happening. Um, I don't know if that's a, it's not a great thing for me, but, you know, Maybe. it maybe too because everybody else is wearing masks they're having a hard time hearing and now they're appreciating yeah what, what you're going through yes and i meant to bring it out what i've what i've done I, I know i'm jumping around here a little bit but what i've done to advocate for myself too is like there's a, a mug that i saw and it says you know um th basically it says something like thank you for um speaking twice i just needed the clarification i'm, I'm hard of hearing and so I use that, I've used it at meetings and I also have a sticker that I put on my laptop. So when I go into meetings, I have that on my laptop just to, it's just a quiet reminder um, to be a nice little reminder instead of me trying to raise my hand. Cause I actually had to sit in a meeting one time, I was called out for whispering again to ask a question. <laughs> and so I just said, okay, here it is. And I told everybody, I said, this is why I have hearing loss. This is why sometimes I can hear, sometimes I can't. Um, and I outed myself, so to speak. Um, and it's helped. I found people very supportive um, as a result. I've also been in the situation too, I'm walking down the hall and someone will call my name and I don't respond. And I find what I do is when I meet new people at work, I will tell them I'm here, you know, I'm hard of hearing. So if you call me and I don't answer, I'm not being rude, please tap my shoulder, get my attention. Um, it's just how I'm living and I'm, I'd appreciate your help. You know, and I'm, you're advocating now more for yourself. And I yes. bet you other people are seeing that because I always say that you don't see the hearing loss, you don't see it. So if you don't say it, nobody knows it's there. So yeah. and signing they can kind of at least know you're you're deaf but if you're hard of hearing you know unless you say it they don't they don't know it so and I think they're going in the right direction yeah I'm trying to advocate for myself I'm trying to learn as much as I can I I've joined the I, I was on the commission for the deaf and hard of hearing for over a year um I needed I had to leave because of my with COVID and everything my work um increased rap I was working till 12 12 14 hour days so it was getting a little lot for me um but I, I I'm trying to learn more I want to be able to help others but I'm open to other people helping in discussing things with me I, I found it very interesting um how um April was talking about her journey and how I, I find myself between deaf and hard of hearing and hearing people and should I learn learn ASL? Who am I going to speak to if I don't? Exactly, it won't do you any good. Yeah, um, unless you're in that environment. Yep. Yeah. Um, I'm also. I just want to make sure I'm covering all the questions. Um, so I wrote down some things. Um, I think you know navigating everything. I think. Um, it takes some maturity too on in, in my part through the years. We're going back over 10, 12 years or more. But um, I think establishing a relationship with your employer, um, having a conversation about your needs in a way that just to help them understand um, instead of you know saying, I need this, I have to have this. It's just trying to get them to understand your situation and what you need. Um, I've also joined online support groups for that uh, helpful information as well. Um, I think it's really been helpful too, through the years. I had contacted a lawyer at one point during this whole journey and asked, you know, what are my rights? I had no idea what my rights were. I was so afraid of people knowing I had to get past that and I had to come out and I had to find out. And the lawyer was really frank with me and said, you have, you have these rights, but if you can work with your employer, try to do that first, try to, you know, see how you can get through. Um, so I always, I, my advice too is 
make sure you're, you're able to establish a relationship with people. There are always going to be some people that you can't work with. Um, but for the most part, I found people to be very um, accept, accepting. Now, as far as accommodations, they haven't done a lot for me. Um, I've done a lot for myself. And um, I'm still- I think it's because you haven't been, you didn't feel the right, even though it's your, you, the American with Disabilities Act that you have that right, that you didn't feel like you wanted to exert your rights. I think I didn't want to, because I had received so much pushback, um, I was afraid of that fight, taking on that big fight. I was afraid um, that I would be targeted possibly for not being able to fulfill the duties of my job, not based on a hearing loss because they can't do that, but they've tried to find another reason. Right. And so I've just stayed you know, I stayed the course for a while, but as I found out, as I've become more true to myself and I've advocated for myself, I ended up getting a 504 plan, even though I don't need it as an adult, um, it was required by my school department. And so I've advocated for myself and it's been helpful. And recently they just installed um, a sound system. So- Wonderful, Claudia. And yeah, about 12 years, but it's finally in. So that's wonderful. Um, and I would say as, as far as job seekers, um, be open to new experiences. Um, don't assume that every employer is not going to want to assist you. Um, and be, proact be proactive and advocate for yourself in, in, a, in a kind way. You know, that's um, educating rather than um, demanding. Well, thank you, Claudia. Does anybody have any questions for Claudia? Feel free to turn on your camera or put something in chat. Betsy. Hi, Betsy. So good. Hi. <laughs> Hi, hello. Uh, good to see you. Good and, to see you. Um, how about, can you tell a few, a few of the details that were in your plan? I know that you had different things about meetings and breaks and lunchtime and- Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so um, I've only, I, I, because of the Meniere's disease, which puts it on a different path than just hard of hearing, I think, if anybody, you know, you can correct me. Um, because I was having difficulty with my boss, um, I had to put things in like, I can't have um, a bus, bus room duty in the gym. I can't, um, I have to, so instead I would do outside dismissal, which would be more conducive uh, for me with the hearing. Um, other things like when there's assemblies in the cafeteria um, auditorium, I would be allowed to put earplugs in um, and have eyes on the kids, but if it gets too loud that I was able to step out of, of the cafeteria. Uh, and that's more so for the tinnitus and the vertigo um, issues. But for the hearing, so as to not cause further damage, it was, you know, I don't want anyone to think I'm being rude by putting earplugs in. You know, I wanted my boss to know why, or if it wasn't this boss, another boss to know why I'm doing it. I also put in um, through Meniere's syndrome, you have to have even salt levels in, in your middle ear. So I had to have a lot of water to keep my body hydrated, which causes issues needing the bathroom. So I've had to put in that I need to use the bathroom. And that was, um, I got a a lot of pushback on that. Um, when we were, they were creating that 504, it was like, why would she have to have that? <laughs> um, and, you know, I had to explain it all. But, you know, I said, it got to this point that if I'm being forced to have a 504 in, and you're not going to work with me, then I'm going to accommodate the, all the things that are part of this syndrome and all of that are, I'm going to notice going down the line. I think now I've also talked to other people and I found out there is a teacher in the school department that has an assistant because she needs someone there who um, she could read the, the, the assistant's lips. It's not an interpreter, but it's an assistant. 
and the assistant hears for her uh, as kids are doing things in the room, things like that. I'm not there yet. And I'm not, I'm not saying that I would go for that um, right now, but I know that as my hearing decreases, there may be a need for that at some point. And now I'm, I'm realizing that that's an option. I wasn't even thinking that like if there's an option for interpreters and I was just thinking like that, is there, is there a way I could ask for um, a video phone instead of being met with, I pick up the phone I can't hear what they're saying. And then they go, oh, she can't hear us, <laughs> you know, um, things like that. So I'll, I'll say to them, why don't you text me instead? And one of the options too, is that I can use my phone. I can have it on my person throughout the day. And what I do is I set timers. And this is my third set of hearing aids. My hearing aids are Wi-Fi um, and Bluetooth enacted. So the timer will go off and I can hear it in my hearing aid as opposed to everybody else hearing it. That's so wonderful. I use that now since the clocks and the bells don't work for me because they're outside of the room instead of in the room. Where you need it. And yeah. there are I, I, I are captioning telephones, even captioning apps for your cell phone now. So you I have can that. Caption phone. So there's so much, I, I do think there's the technology from I'm sure years ago to now is just crazy different. So thank you, Claudia. Thank and we'll you. see you back at the end. Thanks again. Thank you. And our last panelist is Brett. We'll just give the uh, we'll give Bethany a minute to pin Brett. Just one second, Brett. Okay. Thank you, Brett. Hey, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. Can everybody see me and hear me? Okay. Yes. Awesome. Well, first, I just want to thank Denise, and I want to thank Ernest for inviting me to this meeting today. I'm really honored to be a part of this panel. And I also want to apologize. I was running late. I got here very last minute today. I was trying to wrap up a work issue. Um, but um, first of all, um, hello, how are you? Um, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Brett Hayes. And if you don't know me, I'm also a commissioner on the Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Board. And I'm also the chairperson for the healthcare committee. Uh, so I feel like I've gotten to know quite a few of you here. And for those of you I don't know, uh, it's nice to meet you. And I hopefully look forward to collaborating with you in the future. I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, so basically, I am a finance and accounting um, uh, major. And I uh, went to Providence College and here went on. Well, let me kind of go back a little bit earlier. I grew up here in Rhode Island. I, I was born deaf. So basically, uh, my family found out I was deaf. I, they, made, they brought me into the school for the deaf. I started out there until I was about age five. And then I was mainstreamed into the Warwick Public School System. And then I moved on to uh, high school. I went to Henrikin also here in, in Warwick. And in my experience in school, uh, for me, having an interpreter in the classroom was very important to me. And that was the only way I was able to focus uh, by having uh, one person that can pay attention to in front of the classroom at all times. Um, I read lip very well, um, but sign language is not my first language. Obviously, I, I speak English. So uh, to be able to have an interpreter, to not worry about looking at others around me, so I can focus on the task at hand, I can focus on what's in front of me, including my work, my school work, uh, and the interpreter. And then I went to Providence College, and I was fortunate enough to bring my interpreter with me, uh, being local and all. Uh, and I just wanted to call that out because I really think that was instrumental to my personal growth, uh, my schooling, and eventually my professional growth uh, in, in the working world. It, having the interpreters in the classroom allowed me to become more confident in my ability uh, as an individual. And it, and it showed that having accommodation, you can be all you can be. Um, so it's just allowing yourself the opportunity to have those accommodations 
it'll help you be able to perform the role that you have in a working world. Just a little bit of background of my working career. After I graduated from Providence College, this was 2009. And if you remember, this is right when the mortgage crisis was happening. So there wasn't very many jobs out there for anyone at the time, let alone uh, new college grads. And at the same time, uh, with my accounting and finance major, I was talking to public accounting firms because I knew I wanted to ultimately uh, join a public accounting firm and work and support clients uh, through their financial reporting. And uh, luckily at uh, Providence College, we have relationship with several major accounting firms. And it, it really was the networking that I did in the time after I graduated undergrad and stayed through graduate school. It, it when I was able to show through my networking and in the classroom, there was a lot of group work that had to be done in graduate school. And the professor talked with the accounting firm, uh, believe it or not. And I think at first in undergrad, a lot of my peers were able to get jobs in the accounting firm right away, uh, right after undergrad, but I wasn't. So I knew I had to work a little bit hard and, and convince the accounting firms that I am capable to be able to do the job in a group setting. Because ultimately uh, in audit, when you go into public, public accounting, audit is probably the first job that you jump into. And there's a lot of group work. You're in a room full of 20 people. It could be uh, 30 people. And then you have different clients you have to interact with every day. No one person the same every day. So you're dealing with so many different people uh, in terms of uh, languages and um, sounds and dialect. So for me, uh, that was something I had to prove when I was in graduate school. And fortunately enough, uh, through my networking and my diligence and my hard work, I was eventually able to get a job working in a public accounting firm after I got my graduate degree. I started working for PWD in Boston. And right away, I was sent out on the road. I had to go meet a team that was in Maine. There were about 25 people. And we were in a small windowless conference room for three weeks. And you really, they give you a task. You have to learn what you need to do. And you have to meet with the people that, that, that they identify you need to meet with. And that was pretty much a job that you had to do. And I did that job for about two years, but that job was all working in a group environment in a room full of 15, 20, 25 people. And you're trying to work in front of you. That can be a little overwhelming. And um, I started to think that I was not able to keep up with my peers only because it required content communication while you're working at the same time. So I realized I was putting myself in a position to fail only because I knew what my needs were and what I was able to do to accomplish and to be successful. So after two years uh, working in that group environment, I moved over and decided to work for a medical device manufacturing company in the accounting group. And boy, I believe this was probably the best career move I'd made only because I, it allowed me to be the best version of myself in the work setting where I could work ind individually and also on a team, but a team of three people and the same people every day, five days a week, 52 weeks out of the year, 300 and uh, so forth. Um, <clears throat> and that team knew who I was, I knew who they were. So it, it allowed me to blossom and be more comfortable in myself and be more confident in myself in the workplace setting. And, um, and, and, and because of that, I was able to grow within the company. And I've been with the company now nine years this month. And I'm now in my fifth role within the company. And all, all of my roles have been upward movement, fortunately, uh, mostly because 
my, my work through to itself. And also they saw that I could do the work and also be a communicator. And, and to th I was trying to think back about how fortunate I am. A lot of it is really advocating for yourself. And, and I do feel I was much more successful in, I am much more successful in the current environment because I was able to immediately tell the people that I know that I will be working with in every situation, whether it be um, the weekly task, whether it be a project, or whether it be some, um, some major event where it's, it's, very, it's a very big group of people. Um, so that gave me the confidence to, and helped me realize that you have to speak up for yourself. And to me, the accommodations are there for you, but they can't, they can't get provided if you don't tell them, if you don't share what you need. And they're more than happy to provide those accommodations. And now our company is has has grown so much bigger and we're now a global company and now we interact with people uh, all over the world different dialect different languages and we do a lot of our we get a lot of our functional support from parts of the world uh, where there are different languages and when you know they're all supposed to know english as a second language but they still have very strong dialect and accent from their first language, which is completely understandable. Uh, but it requires extra work for me to be able to communicate with them. So fortunately, we can rely on instant measures now at, in the workplace setting through the Microsoft Teams, or even every company might have some sort of internal platform that you can do that on obviously email and believe it or not up until two years ago uh, webcam and virtual camera meeting was so vogue and we knew that in our building we had one special conference room and had all the state-of-the-art technology it had it had the what the webcam technology but only for the executive level employees. And, um, but it's amazing how a pandemic actually promoted everyone to eventually move to Zoom and Microsoft Teams also had camera based in meeting, but it, it took, it, it forced everybody to change right away. And if we didn't have a pandemic, I don't think anyone would be um, leveraging Zoom and Teams as much as we do now. Um, so I have to say technology has come a long way and technology is on our side and we have to be able to leverage it and use it to our advantage. And it actually opened up more opportunities for us. Even now, Zoom and Teams have come a long way and now there's live transcript provided, transcribe providing, aside from having to hire a cut reporter for every meeting. So um, I, the reason why I call that out is I, I, I have to call it out that I'm very fortunate by the timeline that I've grown and the timeline technology has grown at the same time. Uh, but at the end of the day, you really want to advocate for yourself because, uh, and my boss likes to say, you are your own CEO. You have to put yourself in the best position to succeed. And every one person is different. Um, yours may be more visible, ours may be more visible, but it's not going to stop you from getting an opportunity that if you prove that you can do the work and you've shown that you can do the work, you put in the time, put in the effort. And also really the support system around you um, is very helpful. Um, so that, that's what I was trying to think about uh, was important to call out. And I did want to highlight, I like something that James said, is that when you ask for an accommodation, 
you're not doing it to get an advantage. You're, you're asking for it just to be able to participate. And I don't know why the way he put it, it just really hit home. Uh, it was just a simple statement, but it could not be more true. Um, yes, it stands out at first when if you're in an environment, a hearing environment, and and people around you may not be accustomed to that type of accommodation being available. Uh, it might be the elephant in the room at first, but really, people are curious about it because they actually enjoy it and. Uh, they just don't realize sometimes, oh, that person next to me is deaf or hard of hearing. Uh, it makes a difference and it actually kind of loosens people up a little bit. And people, uh, I feel like when you're an adult, you realize everybody has their own flaws. Nobody's perfect. So everybody wants the best for each other, uh, which is to put each other in the best position to succeed. Well, thank you, Brett. Does anybody have any questions for Brett? They can open up their um, camera or um, or put it in chat if they have any questions for Brett. Uh, Brett, have you used interpreters much since you've been out of college? Uh, yeah, um, actually, I I've used interpreters when we had like a major training conferences, or if I know we have pre-planned annual, we call it finance summit, where we all get together from all over the country, all over the world, get together in one place to talk about strategic goals. But the funny thing is, people who plan those events, plan them very last minute. And they don't tell people until the week before, because you're an employee, they expect you to be there, they'll pay for you to get there, but they expect you to be there. Um, so a lot of it is, hey, I need a, I need a, a month heads up if we're going to be somewhere outside of my region. And at least I like to say two weeks if it's in my area so I can go and tell the people I need to ask for an interpreter. Uh, so that that was the biggest thing. And um, But it's funny, like you start to realize it's really the planning side that People are procrastinated everywhere. Uh, so uh, those are the only type of situations I've used interpreters, um, but I've been lucky to have the captain call phone set up at my office at work. And that's only been recent up until a couple of years ago. And, um, and that's right when my job thought it become, have more of a global scope to working with people from other offices. And now with Zoom and Teams, uh, I'm so very fortunate. I, I honestly don't know how I would have gotten through COVID, uh, like, and to do at work, and even personally be able to get through it uh, on a daily basis. And um, but that that's my background, so I'm allowed to be able to do that from home and not make the beat. Um, so um, I I say people who are looking for jobs try to think of. Um, Yes, office work can be pretty mundane, can be, can be a little bit tedious. Believe me, some days I bore myself in my own job, but it has to be done. Um, you know, you have stability and you have technology on your side and you have people that care, that want to help you grow. Uh, so whatever your background is, try, try, to put, try to think of the environment that you would be comfortable in. Well, thank you very much, Brett. Really appreciate that. Well, um, thank you. We're, for the last uh, 15 minutes, we're just going to just do some general questions. We did have a question um, for Al, um, Alex. If you could turn your camera on for a minute. Now it's wait to be spotlighted one second. We did. We had some questions on um, securing interpreters with your companies. How did you approach that, and did they give you any pushback when you did? No, that was just my last thought. I didn't. I just thought that they would have, it would be a negative perception on my ability to work. But 
no, I realized myself that I have the right to an interpreter for better communication access for coworkers and for meetings. And it, it is a federal job. So they already have a system of requesting. The Coast Guard is under uh, DHS, but the interpreting services is under the Department of Transportation because the Coast Guard used to be under the DOT. So they already have a system in place in terms of requesting interpreters. So it's pretty easy to request interpreters. My boss uh, saw an interpreter for the first time. We were already used to um, having interpreters in terms of um, my college. So for me, it was easy for me to use the interpreter. And the interpreter was great too. It was a great making a first impression with me and my coworkers. So the first impression uh, was, was good. And from there on out, that gave me the courage. Like many people said, and in, in on this panel, you think you have more needs than other people, but it's just to be a participant and to be a colleague and to be on equal ground with those colleagues. But for my work, it was a very positive experience in the workplace. That's the other thing about federal government is that they do provide interpreters because they're not thinking about profiting or, you know, what's the budget? How much does it cost? Because that tends to be not something my direct boss needs to be concerned about is budgeting and at the federal level. He's really aware of the process and he's aware um, of me. So I think that that helps with all, the whole process in terms of getting an interpreter. Do you have any advice for other individuals that are going through for an interview um, that is not a well-perceived, like the federal government, where they don't worry about cost and things like that, about how to go about requesting it so they're there for you for the interview and to feel confident about that? For the interview, you mean for the yeah, for the for interview. interview. I think people should be aware that the federal government is provided is is mandated to provide accommodations. And when they're going for the interview at the federal level, they're going to provide you with reasonable accommodations. You as a deaf person should be aware that they are they're, they're legally bound. And the CLO, they're legally bound to provide interpreting services for even for people they're interviewing for jobs. Also, my other advice for people who are looking uh, for jobs at the federal sector, look into the Schedule A processes. So really you can take two hours or even four hours of training on the whole Schedule A process and how it works. But with Schedule A, it gives you, um, how do I say it? It prevents you as a disabled person when you apply for a job. Again, uh, uh, this is pretty detailed and the process is detailed, but those who are deaf and hard of hearing should take advantage of applying at the federal, le at the federal level for a position um, and see, you can see those job postings on usajobs.gov. And that's the really the website that has everything you would go to for federal employment. All of the, all the federal agencies list their employments there. So you can look at the schedule A on that website and the education there will be much beneficial. Yeah, it really protects you that schedule A, I really have to emphasize. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions for any of our presenters? Feel free to turn on your camera or put in chat. D. Wait one second. One second. We spotlight you. One second. Okay. okay. Go ahead, D. So D saying, so I had a question actually 
about Wi-Fi hearing aids, um, the last speaker mentioned, and I'm curious about that. Um, whether, what's the benefit about having a Wi-Fi hearing aid versus other kinds? Oh, you're the one. Yes, Claudia, thank you. <laughs> um, hey, one second, Claudia, one second. Okay, go ahead. Okay, the, their Bluetooth, um, so it connects right to my phone um, and I have an app right on my phone. And if I'm sitting in a meeting, I can direct the microphone to pick up voices that are right in front of me, to the right, to the left, or even behind me. So I can change it. It also, um, it sets different levels. So it depends on the situation I'm in. If I'm in a restaurant and it's very noisy, um, it gives me choices of what what application might work best and, and different levels of the hearing aid. So I can click on it and choose which one works best for me and save it as a favorite. Um, it also works for me because as a teacher working with students, I just recently bought um, a microphone that's like a lapel microphone that I can use with the student and have them read into it and it'll go directly to my hearing aids so I won't miss any sounds that they're saying. It's also great too, socially um, in the car, if I go out and I'm driving my mom in the car, I could put it on her and it, it, through Bluetooth, I can hear her directly since I can't look at her you know, while I'm driving. Um, I'm still exploring the uses of it but I'm finding that it's helpful. Um, I also have another adapter for the television and it goes from the television to the phone and then the phone transmits the sound to my hearing aids. So I feel like it, it's, it's like using um, earbuds, I guess you'd say, you know, like using Apple earbuds, you have that same kind of sensation. You can hear the music. It's, it's very clear. Uh, you can hear people's voices very clear. So I'm, I'm still working with it. Um, and, you know, the other thing is I'm trying to, like in meetings, I have to make sure everybody else is okay with it. <laughs> um, but it is, is that something you got from your um, audiologist? Yes, I, I mean, I was looking it up. I mean, they they're, they run about five thousand dollars, you know, for the for the two five to six, which is expensive. No, it is. And honestly, I mean, I just I've take take a loan. I had to you know do what I had to do. Um, but as a teacher, I needed it. Where if you're not, you know, and if you're not in that environment. Um, I just felt like I needed to do something to adapt. And do you think and insurance covers any of that? No, it's only, um, I think it was only, I think it was 250 each hearing aid. Wow. And that's why I found it very slip when I was told, oh, you can get hearing aids. It's not easy. It's an investment. <laughs> yeah. Especially since the hearing aids, they're changing as quickly as, you know, the technology, as far as iPhones and things like that, you know, within three years, they're outdated. And I, I totally sympathize because I'm not, I'm not in a position to be buying hearing aids all the time either, but I just made this investment to try to help me <laughs> get along a little better until I can find where I need to be. Well, thank you, Claudia. I hope it helps. <laughs> they're called <laughs> Lydex, by the way, they're called Lydex, the ones that I have. They're W-I-D-E-X. Oh, thank you. Thanks for that information. You're welcome. Thank yeah, you. that, that might be helpful, you know, to, to get that word out to, you know, for me, I grew up with a hearing family and people, I can talk and sign because I was exposed to it growing up, obviously. And so I can kind of code switch between those two worlds but a lot of people are not able to, you know, and you will go out and you'll meet people who are so different and it's hard to always figure out if there's a way that we could support them so that they could understand and they'd feel confident interacting with people and they'd get everything and they wouldn't yeah. miss something, you know? So there are a lot of factors to think about, but thank you. Thanks for discussing that. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions for any of our panelists? Uh, Jan? 
Oops. There we go. <laughs> Just one second, one second. Okay, go ahead. Well, it's not so much a question. Um, I just I just want to thank every all the presenters. I thought this was so fantastic. And for, for some of it, it was a little emotional for me because I'm hard of hearing and a, a lot of people don't even know that, but, um, and it and can be very isolating. And I, I know that a couple of the people touched on that um, where um, background noise, um, I think it was Claudia talking about being in the gym, um, but different things like that where, um, I, I just thought it was wonderful. I really want to thank everybody. Um, I know, you know, that I'm sometimes, um, you know, it, with friends out somewhere and I can't hear what anybody's saying. The conversation's just completely lost um, because of the background noise. So um, I had, had a little conversation offline with a couple people and yeah, it's, it's, it can be very isolating. Thank you, thank you, Jan. Um, I oh, Claudia, you had something. No, I was just going to say to Jan. I, I agree. I, it, it can be very um, isolating, even within your own family. You know, they don't understand all the time. And um, I think that this is this has been very important. And I think it's been wonderful to have this opportunity to to talk with each other. And I'd love to do it again. You know, and I think also. Um, trying to get more um, information out to people that are hard of hearing, because I don't think we really have a community yet. And maybe Betsy could pop on for one second. Um, she's the head of the Hearing Loss um, Association. Um, I know they try to do a lot of um, get togethers and things to try to bring um, that information together. Maybe you could touch on that a little bit, Betsy. Yeah. we. We try to meet about four or five times a year at the Warwick Public Library and we for the last, you know, 14, 15 months because of COVID, we haven't been able to do that. Um, but we do try to have discussions such as this with people sharing what they know, what they've been able to figure out. We've had guest speakers and we've uh, tried to, we've developed a looping project and we've tried to um, install hearing loops in different locations in Rhode Island. Um, so we will be starting up, they're going to open up the meeting rooms by the middle of the summer and we'll be starting up again some in person meetings for people to meet each other and to start to form a community of hearing aid users and hard of hearing people. And all are welcome. Uh, you can get in touch with. The commission and they know how to get in touch with me and I'll be able to welcome you. Thank you, Betsy. Yeah. Uh, there's one more topic we wanted to cover if any of our um, panelists want to chime in. It. How has your experience been? Um, have you felt accepted in your work workplace where you're being accepted into lunch invitations and different social atmospheres? Have you felt a sense of inclusion or was there a time where you didn't but you made steps and then you felt included? Is there any tips or strategies um, you'd like to share any of our panelists? Thank you, Brett. One second, we'll just wait, wait to highlight you. Okay, go ahead, Brett. Uh, yeah, I, I would say for the last nine years with the company I'm with now, I was pretty fortunate that I was with a lot of good people that I worked with. And from day one, they made me feel part of the team, like going to launch and getting to know each other. And uh, I'm, I, I get to a little different. I can live with, with people faith to faith. But I will say my first job, uh, when I was with PWD, when we had a team, like the lower person on the team had to take the lunch orders and go get lunch for everybody because we were working through lunch and through dinner. Um, so we'd be working and eating and talking at the same time. And at that time, that was the beginning of my career. I was just trying to fit in and keep up. So I was just following along every conversation. So I felt like I couldn't really like get people to get to know me and share my stories and my experiences in my life when we talk amongst each other. Uh, so I felt a little bit isolated that way. Um, so I just kind of 
held on to that. And in my new company, my new job, I was like, I have to take all these experiences from my first job and go the opposite direction in my new job because I knew what didn't work for me. So I had to keep trying to work on what would work for me. Thank you, Brett. Thank you. Alex, one second, let us highlight you one second. Okay, go ahead. Alex is saying, okay, so I'm the only deaf employee at my workplace and research development center. So early on in my career, I was actually trying to find a way to connect with my coworkers. And they were like a small group setting to get to know each other better. I would set things up. I mean, I wanted them to know me better. And so I pushed myself. I, I made myself get out there with them so that they get used to talking with me. And one thing I learned early on, I mean, I haven't stopped doing that, but this was something we'd go out to have a, there was a group, a beer group. And I think for the first two years, there were four or five or six people who used to get together and they would order certain kinds of, I don't know what it's like different kinds of beers, special beers and have like taste samplings and then talk about it. What did they think of the beer? And I mean, that was fun for me. And it was a nice way to get together with them on a one-to-one -one basis. I could, I could talk with them while we're all there. And that actually helped me connect with them later when we were in the workplace. But of course, it doesn't apply to everybody. Obviously, it doesn't work for everybody. But I would say if your company is big enough, there might be some activities. There might be morale building events a barbecue or something social. And I know it can be uncomfortable for a lot of people to go to those kind of events, but if you do go and you put yourself forward, you'll find some maybe one-on-one -on -one time with certain people who are coworkers there and get to know them better outside of a work setting. And that can actually help you when you're back in the office with your relationships with those. I think that helped for me. For me, it was the beer club, <laughs> but... Um, it can get a little pricey. I finally had to quit. <laughs> I have one more question for you, Alex. Um, it, it was a question again about interpreting services. When you were talking about working with an interpreter before your interview, how did you get the interpreter that was going to be with you um, at the interview if they're the ones that are hiring them? Ah, for me, in my experience, at least, I did some advocacy, advocacy on my end with the company who was going to be hiring the interpreter. I would ask them directly, do you mind if I have some time to prep before the assignment? Because I could share some information. And usually they'll tell me who those people are and their contact if you have a good relationship with the person who's representing the office where you're going to be interviewing. And I, I don't know, from my, the federal job positions, at least, they always have a point of contact POC job position. And that person, you develop a good relationship with them. You email them. You have questions about the job itself. And that's also going to be the person you can say, uh, I need a reasonable accommodation. They're gonna they're going to provide those services, so you can get the interpreter information from them, and you can follow up. You can say, well, once you've assigned the interpreter, if you could give the email or contact and have that interpreter, you know, email or call me, and that's how we have been able to um, set up a time beforehand to prep. Yes. Thank you, Alex. That's great. That's great um, information. Does anybody have any last questions uh, for our panelists? We have three minutes left, so we can maybe do one more question. Okay, well, I want to, I can't thank you all enough for coming tonight and sharing your insight. And I hope if you're not on uh, the CDHH web, um, there. Ernest has his hand up. I don't know if you can. Oh, I'm sorry. Me. Ernest, do you want to say something? And this is saying, yes, I do, actually. I, I just wanted to make a comment, a final comment for the people who are involved. This, this was a great P 
panel, sharing the expertise and experience and also seeing what's the difference between hard of hearing people who don't use sign language and deaf people who do use sign language. They actually have very similar issues. And I just wanted to tell people that the Rhode Island Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing does provide services. We get, um, we serve both deaf and hard of hearing people. But, you know, a lot of people think of us as people who are working only with signing deaf people. And that is not the case. We work with hard of hearing people who do not sign. And I see these struggles that people are having. Deaf people go through this with job interviews, making the relationships with all the different people they're gonna to have to interview. But I'm hearing the same thing from hard of hearing people here. And there is no difference there. The community that we serve at Rhode Island Commission, we support both deaf and hard of hearing. There is no split. We serve the entire community. So I do want to thank the panelists for explaining their jobs and their experience and what their journeys were. And I'm hoping to have more things like this because it's great to see that there's those issues are in common between hard of hearing and deaf people. And I feel like it will make, I'm hoping, hard of hearing people more interested in coming into our uh, fold and coming to our meetings because I don't want them to feel hesitant or feel like there's no place for them. So I want to thank Denise and thank the Employment Committee for having this tonight. This was fantastic. And one last thought, I would like to encourage people, if you're not on the listserv of the Commission on the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, be on the listserv because there's always great information coming out. And I mean, Ernest does a great job of making sure everybody um, learns about what's the new and latest thing out there for both the deaf and hard of hearing world. So um, again, we'll hopefully keep us posted if you need more, if there's some topic you want the, us to cover or any of the other um, committees for the commission, Ernest is always willing to hear from everyone. So again, I wanna thank our interpreters and CART and our panelists and everyone that came tonight. So thank you very, very much, everyone. Thank you, Denise. Thank you. Great. Thank you.